Hello there, everyone, and welcome to episode four of us playing as United Kingdom in TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, United Kingdom lover. But right now, as you can see, the Civil War is upon us, and we must do our best to uh, not die here, basically. Control 41, 21 out of 46 states. Ooh, what is this? Do less attack, less combat acclimatization. Um, hmm. I don't want to hurt ourselves too much. I'm more worried about this, but we'll have to wait and see as time goes on. Let's open, do the first couple opening stages here, shall we? Um, they have too many divisions there. You guys are around there. British Civil War. It seems yet another domino is following the collapse of the Reich's great empire as Britain falls into chaos. Resistance cells have risen up all across Britain, pledging loyalty to the exile government and the promise of a free, independent Britain led by the boss, revealed as Sir Maxwell Knight, formerly head of MI5, and supposed a personal assassin of Downville. A collaborative government, on the other hand, seems divided. Uh, led by an interim government under Ronald Nall came. Though the resistance does seem to have the initial advantage, with the Republic supporting the momentum on their side, both the German garrison and the British army still pledge loyalty to the government. Will these resources be enough to keep Britannic chained to the Reich, or will Britain be free once more? Brother fights brother in this most uncivil war. But we shall do, and the Sobel bell toiled. The time has finally come. The boss was given the command, and they would follow. There had been numerous drills for her this very day, but deep down they were also still surprised that it had come. They did the day that British would start fighting to take back Britain. They would burn down all the old order, and the new one would replace it, and it would be the one Emma and Elizabeth could live in without fear, as they did now. They stood next to each other, both wearing protective vests and holding rifles. They were due to roll out to the local constabulary in a few short moments, seizing the area of Worcestershire for the resistance. Or Worcestershire. And from there, well, it depended on where they were told to go. Where to fight the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> other en enemies. It would be a long, bloody war, but the couple knew that they had to win at all costs, and nothing could stop them. Emma looked at Elizabeth, her Lizzie, and smiled. So how are you feeling, she asked. The other woman said nothing, only gazing off into the distance. Like I'm about to storm P.F. Jenkins Constabulary and kill everyone who tries to stop us, she answered. Emma grimaced. Yeah, I know, it'll be hard, but we have to. Elizabeth nodded forlornly. I know, if we ever want to live, then this is what we'll have to do. And if she stopped, but Emma knew full well what she would have said. The specter of defeat and death loomed over them. Moments passed and they shared a wordless conversation. Elizabeth kissed her lover softly in the cheek. Whatever happens, I'll follow you. I'll always be with you forever. All right, chips, get moving, old Bill yelled, waving his cane into the air. It's time for us to get the job done. God bless us all. And with that, Emma, Elizabeth, and all the other members of that cell of the resistance would march out of the constabulary, ready to burn down the regime. And so it comes. They definitely have the advantage over us right now. Unfortunate. The Transnistria War. Oh. Actually, this is part of the update, too. Oh, God. Ukraine is just falling apart. God, God. At least win somewhere here. Come on. Happy December, everybody. New month for us. Yeah, they actually have quite the push against us. They don't have content yet, but they have quite one hell of a push. My goal is to destroy Nottingham and help to... Oh, oh he's a beach. Oh, that sucks for you, dude. And Ukraine has exploded. Pretty north of us. Retreat. Just hang out there. For now. Civil rights. I thought we already passed the civil rights. Weird, but okay. Bruh. Are you freaking kidding me? What are you supposed to do here? Are you supposed to be able to hold out? Like, bruh, what is this about? I'm not sure if we can hold out. Looks pretty bad for us right now, but I guess we'll keep trying. Um, give it a good old rem to try, I suppose. Alright, well, if you want to do that, that's fine with us. My main goal is just to hold the line at first. Destroy this division here, which is good. Get everyone else on the line as well. Destroy everything they have around here first, though. Anything interesting? No. Move in. Take everything they have first. Hidden heroes. There you go. I'm going to go hold real quick. Go in. Honestly? You guys are, you guys are over there, huh? Well, at least we're winning somewhere here. Because this is god awful for us right now. My god. Why is this so difficult for us? I hate that they limit us to 3 out of 3. I really hate that so much. There you go. Cool. Go 
we got that. So that's good. That's good. So now I can do have one full normal front line. The inevitable come to pass. The bang echoed across the street for all to hear. Emma's hand shook, nearly dropping the gun. She could see the shock and fear written plainly in the soldier's face as she, he looked over and noticed a bloody hole now present in his chest. He fell to the floor lifeless. Emma fought back the urge of vomit, fleeing the scene. They were ambushed while securing a village, and honest to God, German troops were accompanying local police. They escaped mostly unscathed, but one had gotten too close to the base, she, still she had no choice. So why was this expression haunting her? Uh, Emma sat alone in the corner of the makeshift camp, staring blankly under the distance of all others milled around her past her, as if everything was totally normal with the world. Nothing about this was normal, nothing at all. Uh, mm? uh, a voice, a familiar voice said next to her, and her head snapped around, and she instantly recognized the love of her life. Oh, hello, Liz. Sorry, didn't see you there, she said, looking away. Elizabeth shook her head, sitting down next to her. I heard you've had your first kill today. How are you feeling, Emma Scott? Like I just killed a lad the same age as me and ran away. And they sighed. It would have done the same to one of us, love. It's awful that we have to do this, but you can't let yourself get wrapped up in your head like this. Emma nodded shakily. She began sobbing gently, and Elizabeth cradled her as she did. It was the first time either one of them killed a man, and it would not be the last. So, what type of buffs do they have here? Because this is kind of ridiculous. Or do you have any buffs? They get more attack. They get less defense. Do we have any debuffs? Armor attack and defense. That's all we get. That's not good. Oh, hello. Targeted by Himmler, huh? Ah, this doesn't help us either, does it? That's such crap. Well, we need more military stuff. Then I attack. Structural exhaustion. Bi-weekly acclimation gain. Well. I'm going to start wrapping stuff up through here. We should be able to defend for the most part up here at this point. Um, you should be able to help out. Hold on. Push. Oh, what's going on here? Hold. hold and sit tight. Alright, so now we're actually doing decently. Agreement at last was ironic. Now Kane felt that the first time the cabinet could ever be truly described as being united on an issue while it was during his time divisioning civil conflict. But of course, now is the time to expect the unexpected. However, one thing he was very much expecting was a briefing he was receiving in the cabin room regarding the nation's finances, which were also expected beyond saving, of course. Pretty normal, I'd have to say. Butler, being the Chancellor for the Exchequer, was given a full report on the absolute financial destruction the nation was facing. Attempting to collect taxes currently would be simply impossible in most cases. Oh, uh, massive price rises have also been reported in nearly every industry, and strikes over pay rises have started in nearly every industry. If you think that we could yield to these strikes, but we may think on, with the claws of Bolshevism present in every trade union, we cannot afford to show weakness to those rats for even one second. This was Fontaine who was making an uncharacteristically good point in Nail Kane's eyes. If you allowed me to finish, Andrew, I would have agreed. Not simply because of the obvious communist influence behind these strikes, but also because we cannot afford to do so. Indeed, not only can we afford to grant pay raises, but pay cuts and freezes are an absolute necessi necessity right now, in order to balance our spending to some degree. I was just countermanding the effects it would have on the people by introducing price controls. We also need to introduce a system of rationing, for which I would suggest modifying the old plans from the war. Fountain struggled to think of something he would disagree with there, and it couldn't. Butler's plan surprisingly sounded just like, like common sense to him at this critical stage. He wasn't pleased that Butler's two cronies, Wilson and Maudling, who were also present in the room, were to be given charge of implementing this, but the actual plan seemed not sound enough. So we're enemies, united by war. We have got what, to finish this war off. Because I don't know if we can actually hold here anymore. I'll be honest. Because this is turning into complete crap for us. All they do is attack and attack and attack and they come in super easily.
and divisions just can't do anything about it, apparently. Keeping your head, you fascist hag! Screamed one of the rioters, hurling a brick towards the MP that was his targeted. Uh, hoping to smash the cow's repugnant face in as you tackled to the ground by one of the overwhelmed policemen trying to hold back the tide of enraged Londoners. Uh, the brick did not hit Jane Birdwood as it was supposed to, but it did fly right in the chest of the black shirt to her left with a meaty thump, doubling him over in an instant. The other paramilitaries quickly formed a shield of sorts around the group of harassed fascist MPs, protecting them from the projectiles hurled across the Thames from Westminster Bridge by the riders. Almost running to the nearest entrance to Parliament now, held open by terrified clerks like the port portcullis of a besieged fortress. Birdwood struggled not to scream. This was a nightmare. It had to be. Himmler was dead. It had to be. was destroyed. It couldn't have rebuilt itself so quickly. It couldn't have outmaneuvered them so completely, could they? Suddenly, the smoke-filled air and furious shouting were replaced with ancient walls and uh, uh, frantic discussions. The doors behind the MP slammed shut as a black escort peeled off to aid the beleaguered police. I took everything she had for Birdwood to not fall to her knees and she relief. Minister Birdwood, I need a, a moment to talk, came the overstressed Strained voice of original maudling, crossing over to his nominal rival. I've got a bill ready to stem the bleeding from her trade, but a few of you old guards are dissenting. Nell Kane's given the green light. Could you please ask him to vote aye? We need unity. The Rage of London echoed, and the bird would nod it all at once. Never this one. Eh, maybe not. In the wake of the massive threat against our government, our quickly loosening grip over the city and a lack of soldiers, we have no other option but to push for police militarization, granting them guns and designating them as part of the military. What well, normally would not be considered, we are in dire straits and quickly losing control of the few cities we possess. Our police officers are not trained for war, yet they must do their duty and protect law and order in Britain, whatever the cost. Get in there and kill them all. The wall holds. It's, uh... The sky was as gray as sin, Hawkins noted. He had stood outside the base, expecting to hear the familiar trundling of wheels on hard earth any moment now. Part of him was still mentally occupied with how dire the situation seemed to be on the mainland. Apparently, the resistance had been upping attacks as of late, um, with a small force being sighted for the south. A patrol had been sent to deal with them, but he had heard nothing back yet. Hawkins' fears were a sewage, however, when he spotted a familiar armed truck trundling towards him on the distance. It came to a stop directly parallel to him, as what looked to be the entire patrol filled out and stood to attention. At ease, he said, saluting them. How went the mission, men? He already knew the answer. Their paces were relaxed and their profession was light. He had faintly heard the sound of a jaunty batter coming from within the truck before they come out of it. It had gone well. Taking a step forward, you will be happy to know it was a great successor. All three boats were sunk and any of the blighters that made it to land were dealt with. No casualties on our side. He said not without a satisfied smirk. Hawkins had a half mind to discipline him, but he couldn't. Uh, everyone in the aisle needed a win where they could get one. He nodded, grinning back lightly. Jolly good, you're all dismissed for the day then. Good work. The troops cheered, making their way onto the base to presumably tuck into their rations for the night. Once they were gone, he sighed. That was another day they held out. He dabbed his forehead with a handkerchief before looking back out at the skyline. How many more perfect victories would they get? Safe for now, at least. A gray, gray haze. When all the parties involved in the swearing in of Reginald, of Reginald Ronald uh, Nalukane's new government would look back on the fateful day, they would all distinctly remember it almost as it was a veil. Everything they felt muted. Nal Kane himself remembered mumbling out of the customary words, swearing to serve in the best capacity as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Rep Butler was shaking like a leaf. He had been one of the first at the scene of Domville's fiery grave, and Andrew Fontaine kept a stony expression, staring into the distance as if deep in thought when not being spoken to. When he had finished, swearing his oath, he simply nodded. Thank you, gentlemen. I am aware that I have arrived at a critical time if we wish to save Britain from Bolshevism. I'm sure they will all strive to crush these upstarts forthwith. He nodded once again, having made a somewhat lackluster speech. Shuffled off to another room to be briefed. This left Butler and Fontaine alone in a room together. For a few moments, the, men were too, the two men were silent. Then Butler spoke up. How's it come to this? He asked. Fontaine was silent. Butler coughed, snapping him out of his reverie. How's it come to what? He asked, rather snappily. To the point where you and I are going to have put aside our differences to keep the nation running. Fontaine scoffed. You aren't immediately jumping ship to join your fellow democracy-loving traitors in the resistance. I'm surprised. Butler repressed the urge to spit on the man. Well, yes, oddly enough. I detest the radicals who put our nation in danger as much as you. And if we want Britain to come out of this with a modicum of stability, we can let the petty ideology get in the way. Fountain hummed and nodded. A uh, united front can only help. Salvaging MI5. Perhaps the greatest shock and embarrassment of this rebellion was a revelation that our own Maxwell Knight, supposed low commander of the MI5, was a mysterious boss and leader of the resistance. With this revelation, the extent of the resistance infiltration in our government has been laid bare. It's not a pretty sight. We never supposedly loyal agents have defected, joining the resistance, leaving our intelligence services barren of loyal staff. Luckily, despite the mass defections in the department, Kim Philby, a passionate fascist since the 30s, has remained loyal. In recognition of this loyalty, we shall appoint him to the head of MI5 and task him with filling in Nat's shoes. He's quite a task ahead of him, as the extent, as the extent of Nat's corruption lies deep, yet he will triumph if he has to. So, how do we increase military confidence? We have to increase it. Q. 
Can you, like, kill somebody? My god. Like a soldier. Come on, stop the fucking game, come on. Orphans of War. It was in the ruins of a bombed house state where they found her. The troops were advancing through a ruined suburb when they heard a soft cry coming from inside one of the wrecked houses. They readied their weapons and stepped in, only seeing a nine-year-old girl sobbing on the floor, clutching a dirty doll and sitting next to a pile of rubble. Underneath it, a single pale hand was sticking out. They stood just there, shocked at the sight. Swallowing, Ben decided to be the only one to talk to her. Hello, he said softly. What's your name? The girl didn't respond initially, only looking down, clutching her doll for dear life. Are mommy and daddy going to be alright, she asked, looking up at him. Ben felt something deep inside him waver. The girl had to know on some level that her parents were never coming back, but that would uh, never make it easier to tell her. No, I'm sorry they've gone to heaven now, um, he said. As calm as he could, the girl's face plummeted. Even further, then she began to sob, panicking. Uh, ben put his hand on her shoulder. Mm, sh there, there, I know you must be very scared and sad right now, but if you come with me and my friends are here, we can get you somewhere safe. How about that, huh? He extended his hand. She looked at him warily before taking it. Ben forced a soft smile. He knew that she would probably be shipped off to an orphanage as soon as they got back to base. Hopefully she found a good family. But the pain would never leave her. She had lost everything in this war, and as they left the ruined house, he turned back and looked, coming to one realization. He had a lot to lose as well. Like a soldier. Now Kane leaned back in his chair, as his mind rushing at what felt like a million miles an hour. The countless different military plans for small ports, small towns, and small campgrounds across the country. The constant badgering of the factions within Parliament. Not only with that, but he'd deal with the Visa Meyer and his squadron. If it was offered to go back to being just the foreign minister, he would gladly accept it. We need some of these, these goddamn cities back. Come on. Start working for it. The phone rang. His hand dragged across his face as he asked his assistant who was on the line. Kim Philby uh, froze his face, and as quickly as his face froze, his hands picked up the phone. Hello, this is the Prime Minister. What do you have to tell me? Perhaps he was a uh, Philby respondent. Sir, I have incredibly unfortunate news to tell you. As my sources say here, several of the party's MPs in the Commons have flipped allegiance against London. They're clearly working within the uprisings as we speak. Now, have a list of names here with me. Do you wish for me to list them now or send them to your office later? Another thing to deal with. Why now? You already had too much to deal with, and now this. Now, Kane took a deep breath. Or a sigh. Not, no, just send them to my office. I can't bear a meeting today. All right, Prime Minister. The document should be there in an hour. Anyways, I'm afraid that these defections were the work of sleeper agents and stolen hundreds of documents. I suggest you watch out for those sleeper agents, as they could be anyone. Good, but bye, Kim. Uh, now, Kane slammed the phone down and placed his hands on his head. Uh, the adrenaline was rushing like a crazed German with an M14 to his stomach. He questioned briefly if he should stay sober for now, but then he thought if this wasn't an excuse for a drink to for a drinker to drink, I wouldn't know what would be. Where are my tanks? Like we get bonuses of tanks, but that's like all we have. A single tank division. And you down there too. And you're up here as well. We don't have very much, do we? Chaos begins. Oh, it's already begun, has it not? Come on, do better. Hmm. Can you take out York, actually? Yeah. We'll do what we must. Come on, tanks. Ah, uh, officers Jerry's did not expect to be essentially put on the front lines of the war that day. It started as they usually did. He gently moseyed his way down to the police station that morning as he usually did, idly greeting Miss Pig Pocket along the way. She asked about his family, asked about her, their, hers, they parted. When he reached the police station, the young officer was met with a set of Constable Combees frantically hammering planks of wood over the windows. The man looked over his shoulder, a wild look flashing across his face before he be became visibly relieved upon recognizing Jeffries. Thank God you're here, lad. Get in, go on, he said. When Jeffries didn't budge, his face grew, grew visibly stormy. I was thinking, the heck inside, he yelled, violently gesticulating towards the door. Normally he would have questioned why exactly the superior was behaving like an unhinged maniac, but the look in his eye told him not to question it. He complied. Jogging inside the police station, instead of the usual quiet atmosphere, he was met with every officer he had known hurriedly rushing along, all looking deeply worried. Suddenly felt something cold and metallic being pushed into his hands. Take this, you'll need it. A gruff voice said, disappearing as fast as he had arrived. He looked down and saw something he never expected to carry in his line of duty. A gun! He had been a police officer for four months, and he was begin being given a gun. Confused, Jeffries frantically scanned the situation of the station for a friendly face. There he saw Officer Trenway, another new recruit. He strode over, tapping him on the shoulder. What the heck's going on, mate? We're in the middle of the bloody East Anglia. What do we need guns for? The other officer answered, a grim expression written on his face. We're a bloody war, mate. Man must hold. It's not bad. Yorkshire, or Yorkshire? Yorkshire will not fall. 
Though much of our northern heartlands were lost to the socialist traitors of the left resistance, a few cities have resisted the Red Terror. But most cities of the north have been taken over by the communist unions, who have been deluded by traitors' forces into believing they are fighting for the workers. Yorkshire stands defiant against the rebel forces. Yorkshire? If only we reinforce and preserve our holdings there, do we have the possibility of winning the war in the north and bringing unity to Britain? You need stability in times like these, you know? Oh, you wanted to go somewhere, huh? I don't think so. Come on, move your frickin' guns faster. You're not gonna lose here. I, I swear to God, you are not gonna lose here. You move in here and just kill them all. Fight my armor, you scum suckers. On His Majesty's Secret Service. Nail Kane decided to put down the phones, being able to think for less than a second before his thoughts were drowned out by the siren of a passing police car. Groaning, leaned back into his chair and waited for the new head of the MI5 to enter into the makeshift office of the PM. All right, on time, Kim Philby, one of the few senior agents of MI5, still lord of the collaborationist government, strode in through the door, seemingly a great deal more at ease than anyone else, given the country was quite literally collapsing before their eyes. Philby took a seat, said Nail Kane, gesturing for the spy to sit down. I'll take you to realize why you're here. Of course, Prime Minister, Philby replied, crossing his legs. Where do I begin? As soon, or when do I begin? As soon as possible. We need to say what we can of MI5 and fast. Who knows how many spies that darn communist night planted while he was in charge? You need to do a full purge, make sure everyone's loyal. Everyone. Philby nodded along and replying, I'll do what I can, sir. You can rest assured that I and all true sons of Britain and intelligence shall work tirelessly to see the traitors destroyed and their intel influence cleansed from our shores. Nal Kane grinned. Now there was a fire that he needed. There was a determination and that would win them the war. However, so much such a purge will take time, I'm afraid. We'll need MI5 up and running as soon as possible. We hope to achieve victory in the war. I will, of course, care enhanced surveillance of our operatives and other such measures, but for now, I believe our focus should be winning the war. Agreed, most of the traitors will have defected with that already, I'd imagine, but keep an eye out all the same. Make sure every one of them ends up dead. Philby gave one final nod and, sh and shook the grateful Prime Minister's hand before leaving, quickly suppressing a satisfied smirk as he headed off to get to work. A most loyal gentleman, and, and man must hold. While the island is in chaos, we must not forget our external enemy. To the north lies the Infernal Republic of Iceland, the bastion of the OFN in Europe. They not only recognize the rebels as official government, but also mock us by openly supporting the rebels, acting as a final stop for Himmler aid from the Americans. Westward of the Irish are supposed allies in the pact, yet they remain curiously neutral in the matter of our current predicament and frustratingly negligent in doing anything but the smugglers passing through the Irish Sea. It is thus, thus crucial that we hold on to the Isle of Man and prevent any more OFN aid from reaching our shores. Yeah, that's better. 35% is better. I got more political power, which is also very good. Ooh, port area right now. Yeah, we need more command power. Penetrate all the layers. There you go. We've got to penetrate through here. Come on. Nothing. A noble's revolt. Darnable traitors, dishonorable curs, blessed Jacobites. While I've been shouting and screaming for such insults for the last five minutes or so, enraged at the news that had just reached him. The crossbenders who have been on oh so inactive all these years that BPP have been in power, never bothering to show up to Parliament or even joining the party, hadn't done so out of apathy as he suspected but contempt. Nearly all of them had joined Himmler, of course. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't understand it. Why? Why were these men and women from barons to dukes so eager to aid an unwashed horde of vagabonds, communists, and cutthroats? Did they not realize that Peerage was doomed to these American puppets one? To say nothing of the communists who formed the bulk of their forces had they forgotten their hatred for all things noble. Uh, why? What could possibly have driven them to such an act? How could they be willing to risk their own annihilation for the vague platitudes of freedom and democracy that Himmler offered? Loyalty to, to Elizabeth? Did they not see Edward's removal from the throne was illegitimate and unjustified? Well, I would never understand why so many peers had joined Himmler, why so many felt disgust and horror of the new Britain Germany had created. But I did understand one thing, when the dust had settled and victory belonged to the government, then the balance power in the House of Lords would forever be altered in his favor. Um, and there would be many baronies and duchies in need of new noblesmen to take up their new stewardship. Baronies and duchies that could soon belong to his own men. Hey, we finally got him. Good, kill them all. Lost 38,000, they've lost more divisions, they have more divisions than us though, overall. Red Revolution in Greece. Oh, Greece actually has some slight content. That's cool. Just stay alive. Medic, medic. We need a medic now. Ben was almost paralyzed with panic as he desperately shouted for aid among the din of the battlefield. The soldier was cradling. He was, was heavily bleeding from his shoulder, a bullet having just gone straight through it. 
It was almost impossible to hear whether any hope, hope for the poor man was coming or not over the screaming and shouting as if his comrades charged onward into the gunfire. The soldier coughed, breathing heavily. Just stay with me, mate, yeah? Help will be on its way soon. Do you have a name? A moment passed, and Ben feared the soldier just passed away in his arms. Adolf, he said, wheezing. My, na my name is Adolf. Uh, ben sighed with relief. I explained the German military insignia on his clothes, at the very least. Oh, Adolf, huh? <clears throat> Well, I suppose it's no great wonder why you were named after then. He joked, trying to lighten the mood. The German looked to be around his age, youthful face, with only wisps of a blonde mustache growing. Ben briefly wondered whether he'd been even chosen to join the German or join the garrison like he had the army, and that he probably had a family home as well. He let out a white gurgle that could be construed as a laugh. Well, that is what many of you Englishmen think, he said. A strange ghost of a smile on his lips. It's actually my uncle Adolf Hans, not the Fuhrer. A loud bang came from five meters away, and that smile faded. Go, there's no use dying for me. There was a grim determination on his face, but Ben would not be rattled. I'm not leaving another man behind. I don't know how they do it in Germany, but over here we take care of our soldiers. It's just a flesh wound anyway. Now, Maddock, he shouted once again, his throat searing in pain. Eventually, one did arrive, dragging it off away on a stretcher. Shaking himself, Ben charged back into the fighting. He had a job to do. He can only hope that it hadn't been for nothing, of course. I want you to stay here. Well, God, you get over here then. Fear of the Third's Great Journey. I'll be honest, like, I like the Civil War, I like this whole component, but, like, all this reading is stopping us from doing the Civil War, which I hate a lot. I, like, I get it's TNO, but we have a literal war on our hands I want to focus more on. Go figure. Structural damage, huh? Our military confidence has just crapped the bed. What are we supposed to do here? I can't do any of these because it's going to just ruin us. Peter the Third's Great Journey. Peter called out a, a secretary wandering the halls of 10 Downing Street after hours. Peter, where'd you go? As each turn in each room, she turned on the lights, poked her head in, and called out for the chief moosier. Her hope was that he would emerge from the shadows, a half chewed rat in the mouth of, as an apology for his absence. The rest of the officers had long given up that hope. Ever since the Civil War had erupted, 10 Downing Street was a chaotic blur of harried civil servants and an ever growing military presence, partly coordinating with the war, alongside Nal Kane's staff. Somewhere in that chaos, Peter the Third had quietly slipped away. Her search having exhausted all corners of the office, she was permitted to travel. The secretary then expanded the streets surrounding Downing. When the day was done, she traveled London with a tin of liver in hand, calling for the absent chief monsieur. Every stray was a potential contact, every chewed pigeon in an alleyway a clue. She pursued her work with tireless dedication, searching for the one thing that made this blasted job worthwhile. On the tenth day of her extended search, she went to Soho Square Gardens. It was night, and electric lights bathed the park in warm amber. It was in this period of a national emergency all was still save the faint weird whirl of jeep engines and jackboots on concrete. There, between the legs of uh, Charles II's marble statue, Peter III, was scored up, her eyes shone with their light. Liver in hand, she slowly approached a cab. He rose his head, but did not move. She set the liver down to the base of the statue, and Peter III poked, prodded, and finally ate the gift. He cranked his neck up and looked at the secretary, whose hand was extended towards him. She liked to think that she understood what he was thinking. The soft purr, the nuzzling of her open hand, was a final thank you. Then he turned and leaped off the statue, scurrying into the bushes. It was as close to a resignation as a cat could give. Peter the Third spent his final days roaming England, whose adventures are far beyond our scope. How much more do they have to give? Like, seriously. They have all the advantages. They have so many advantages, it's not funny. We have nothing but, like, weakness here. Like, we get penalized for so much. And they have no penalties or something. Garden variety sexism. And once Emma and Rodney successfully overcome the initial blockade, Elizabeth and Martin will sneak through and steal the files. They've already got the key details of the oil supplies, and so we pull this one off well, we'll be dealing a major blow to the government's forces in the region. Any questions? The room was mostly silent following Bill's explanation of the plan. A map was laid out on the table in front of the soldiers, detailing how the operation was meant to go. Nobody was saying very much, until a man with a ratty beard and a sour expression raised his hand. Bill nodded at him. Yes, Martin? Uh, oh, what is this? Oh, if this plan is meant to be as important as you say. Uh, then why is it being uh, done by these two? He said, pointing at the two women. Uh, excuse me, Emma said, instantly defensive. Uh, Martin scoffed. Look, no offense, sweetheart. Uh, I'm sure you're both lovely, but this is the war. There's no place for either of you. The other in the room looked, ag looked aghast. Years in the SLB made Martin a bit insensitive at times, but they didn't realize he would come out with something like this. Elizabeth stormed over to him, a face like thunder. We are not delicate little flowers in need of protection. 
I don't care whoever the heck you think you are. Say that about us again. I'll show you whose place is whose in a minute, mate. Feeling obviously challenged, Marge stood up and considerably taller than Elizabeth. Would you want to test that out, love? He asked. Um, Emma um, immediately bolted over to her lover, glaring at the man. Hey, try us, you stupid. I'll give it a rest, you lot of you. Bell Bellow, bringing all eyes to him. Uh, in case you've all forgotten, we're in a war for the very soul of the country. I don't give a crap between your legs in this situation, and neither should anyone else. If you're too mature to handle that, then get out. The room was silent once more, so glaring at Martin, Emma sat back down, Elizabeth behind her, Bell nodded. No, good, as I was saying. Are we doing anything here? Like, come on. Raid, and hopefully don't get blown up, you know. That's well, good for experience. Uh, yeah, going there too. Uh, these haughty tyrants ne'er shall tame. The mess tent was crowded nearly to bursting, so full that only half the fighters inside had a chair somewhere to sit. The rest stood, straining to hear or see the object of every single person in the tent's attention. A small portable radio carefully placed on an unused mess table at the center of the tent. After a moment's fiddling, followed by a thumbs up from the technician, the radio crackled to life. In decades past, we've witnessed a rise of what can only be described as a great steel curtain across Europe, proclaimed the staticky, staticky voice of Harold Macmillan. Under its oppressive grip, culture, civilization, and history are all ground underfoot by a vile butcher's barbarism, one dedicated pure and simply to the enslavement of the continent. Regardless of the differences and conflicts, these people subjugated by the Swastika now share a common bond, one of the shackled uh, seeking to cast off the chains. From Edinburgh to Moscow, we see the depths of the struggle across the Nazi Empire, a struggle that cannot, must not be allowed to fall. Whatever our differences or creeds, they must be set aside for the satanic effort to succeed. A second voice is heard over the radio now, replacing the dignified Edwardian voice of Macmillan. In a free nation, those differences were once celebrated, declared Michael Foote. It can be said that there was nothing more than British than to express one's confidence or one's lack of confidence in ideas, yet now our country is divided into two in a far graver way by those fighting for free England and for those dedicated to her subjugation. But it is for this reason that either I and the Prime Minister in Axel urge you to remember that whatever differences is striving for free England, what is important is that we strive together, a common sentiment among all fighting for free Britain, whatever their beliefs. A certainty that Britons never, ever shall be slaves. Well, we'll see. Man was sold. Scotland, a great ally and ally in, in, in the Union partner, has fallen under the occupation of the rebels. The Highlanders are totally under control of the resistance, and the Lowlands are quickly falling under the control. Our last and greatest fortification in the region lies in Edinburgh, the true seat of power in Scotland. If we hold on there, we may yet have the opportunity to halt their quick expansion and eventually take Scotland back, and without pride, we are nothing. The history of Britain is long, stored and great, filled to the brim with great men who have shaped the world in Britain's image. This is not the first time Britain has been challenged to face internal divisions before, from the anarchy that brought ruin to the kingdom of the Jacobins who sought to tear down the beloved Union. Time and time again, Britain has been challenged and laid waste by internal enemies, yet we have not only survived but prospered in the wake of their failures. This foolish rebellion shall be nothing more than a roadblock to our ultimate success, a footnote in the long and glorious history of our isles. Good. We're slowly turning it around, hopefully. Second revolt seed, huh? Be offensive anyways. I want Birmingham, but I want Worcester, Worcester first. And so the long game begins. Despite the overwhelming odds of being against us, we have survived and we are scarred, and yes, we are battered, but we still live. Through the graces of God and the sacrifice of a brave serviceman, we have survived the initial assault against us by the traitors. With survival, the worst is over, and we can finally plan to strike back against the traitors. Now we must plan for the future. The winner must offer, will offer us respite from the war and give us time to regroup and revitalize our forces. We must use this time wisely, not waste the precious time we have prepared for the future. The war may not be over by Christmas, yet we must hope that in a year's time, peace will have returned to the island, or so we hope. So basically, we, we, they have the advantage in the beginning, and then we have to kind of get back to it. One, two, three, one. Three places to really hold out. Come on, circle down to the last. I grapple with thee. Get him in, get him in, get him in. No, no. 
Birmingham, god dang it. The smoky streets of London were crowded beyond belief, packed by civilians desperately trying to salvage what goods they could before war came to the city. And among such a teeming mass of people, James Carter knew he had given an easier time blending in than usual. Two decades they had made blending in almost second nature to him. Stay out home outside work, no close friends, and avoid personal conversations and practice stories. Simple rules, but ones that along with his natural shyness and low family friends that kept him alive. As he turned the corner to a grim alleyway, he felt a brief pang of guilt for the last part. Mr. and Mrs. Card hadn't been under any obligation to take him in, or to forge documents in a name for him. He'd work hard to repay them, helping Mrs. Carter around the home and er earning what he could for working for Siemens for RG IG Farben. Without little attention, the boss was paid. He sold in a timer here, some chemicals and metal shards there. For the time, he put his knowledge from his old life to use, putting it all together into a heavy device now weighing down his right coat pocket. Just a few more blocks. Drunk soldiers eavesdropped in on in a pub were far from the most reliable sources, but he knew this target well enough to know the cunt wouldn't miss a chance to speak like this. His patience was reward after a brief few minutes of walking. He could hear the cunt's voice, even the reedier than it had sounded selling out his countrymen on the radio. Preering out of the alleyway, he saw a familiar face in his suit dressing, addressing a group of uniformed soldiers. You young men are out our defense against Judaism and liberalism, announced the NPR. Whatever else the young men would, it would never be known. Filled with rage, Eli reached into his coat and threw the before taking off down the alley in a sprint. Even without looking back, he could identify the pain screams of the voices that had haunted him so long. It would haunt him and his people no more. So this is Christmas? A lot has always been quiet, quiet for Emma. Her parents would wake her up early in the morning to go to the service in the local church before they would head back home to open up however many presents they could afford that year. If it was snowing, she would go outside to play in it with her friends before they called her in for a large dinner, of course, as she grew older. It was less frolicking around in the snow and more sneaking in illicitly, gained bottles of a beer, but the spirit remained the same, of course. You know, we're going to have everybody help out here. This Christmas was very different, to say the least. For one, she was not gently roused from a comfortable bed. Baba woken at five in the morning by a loud screeching noise. She shot up, literally trying to reach for the gun she kept at her bedside. Elizabeth was quicker, leaping out of bed and looking around. What was that, Emma? Wake up, Emma. What the heck was that? She asked as her partner shook herself awake. No idea, she said, running outside. As it turned out, they had been equally as confused. Old Bill later clarified that it was a faulty air raid siren that had been triggered by the snow. He hadn't seen this down as a downside, however. As a de facto leader of the cell, he had gotten everyone to participate in gift-giving exercise, and the early get-up only meant that he could do it earlier. So there Emma and Elizabeth sat, drinking the lukewarm mugs of tea and trying to fight off the bidding bitingly cold air that threatened to come into their tent. So, Emma said, chucking nervously, I don't exactly scrounge up this much here. Couldn't do it, but she paused before producing a necklace. It was my mom's. It's not worth much, but I swiped it before we ran away. Elizabeth immediately began cooing over it, draping it over her neck. Oh, it's lovely, darling. You shouldn't have, she said, starting to rummage through her bag. Then she produced a small picture, passing it to Emma. Here's mine. It was less costly, of course, but I did have to bribe Ginger with a few cigarettes. As Emma looked at it, she realized it what it was. It was a picture of her their cell in the old cig cigarette factory, grinning and smiling. She had meant to ask for a copy, but they hadn't had time. Her heart melted and smelling at her partner. I couldn't ask for anything more. Oh, they're definitely going to be attacking us again. Um, why don't you go there? Infantry. Up out. Our heritage. Uh, actually, how are we looking here? It's getting worse, but whatever. Across this great nation, our brothers and sisters died to protect our kingdom against rebel elements who seek to tear apart the very fabric of our society. After a long period of stability, the Prime Minister Donville gave our country this nation was thrown into disarray by these terrorists. Because of their actions, Britain see hardships uh, they haven't seen since wartime years, and what for what purpose? To tear down our traditions? Those terrorists want to make Britain slaves to the Americans, whose Anglo-Saxon people struggle against an ever-increasing encroachment on their rights. The so-called resistance only wishes to bring race war, class warfare, and anarchy to this system all. Our history is a glorious one. Our people, first living as tribesmen in northern Germany, moved to these islands and tamed their wild marshes that turned into one of the greatest kingdoms of the medieval world. Not content to sit idle, we spread out to conquer the hills of Wales, the mountains of Scotland next. With our island completely ours, we turned our eyes to the sea. From Ireland to America, India, and Oceania, we spread our civilization from one corner of the earth to the other. All this was done under the auspices of our whole sovereign and legitimate government, which acted in his name. These golden years culminated in the Victorian era, the Pax Britannica. Britannia ruled the ways, and we were the unchallenged ruler of the world, and yet we allowed subversive elements to create a rot in our society. Under the pretext of liberty, just as the resistance claims now, our institutions were slowly destroyed one by one. This subversive final victory was achieved in the Second World War, in which our glorious empire collapsed. Only in the last few years, has Britain been finding its greatness once again with the assistance of our Germanic brothers. This is what the resistance wishes to stop. They want to end our natural, national renewal before it has even begun. All in the name of the democracy, they'd sooner make us a republic and tear down the last vestiges of our cherished heritage. Stand with our kingdom. Um, stand with our kings. Fight for your heritage. A half truth is still technically a truth. Oh god, the oil depleting. Oh god. Do whatever we can for oil. Oh, we do need oil. Your factories. Unstaffed. 
Birmingham at all cost. Our men wavering. Agriculture gets better though. That's not bad too. Our vital soldiers are placable, placable rivals. Our avowed extremists. Our wives in. Our simpler solution. Simplification, simplification, simplification. BSA quality checks. The Panzer shall halt. They're defining combat. No, the fight, the fighters as well. The crews on auxiliaries. You get more oil, which is nice. Um, the factory's unstaffed. As we watched the German economy collapse, we naively thought things could not get worse. Unfortunately, they, we were mistaken. A disturbing number of our workers have been drawn in by the social slides, confusing to join the ill fated rebellion. Those who remain loyal have been mostly conscripted and sent out to defend our brave isle. Um, our production lines, already on the brink thanks to the economic rash, or crash, have been seemingly broken under the weight of this pressure. We must find a solution to these ills, or even if we survive their assaults, our soldiers shall soon find themselves fighting without weapons. Good cheer all around. It was usually against regulation for a pair of soldiers to be up late as Ben and Adolf were that Christmas night, but they could hardly be singled out. Their officer had arranged for a few kegs of fine German beer to be smuggled into the encampment so they could make merry as they best could. Of course, as the night went on, activity began to peter out, but Ben and Adolf had remained out, sipping their beers and looking at the sky. The two men remained close after Ben had rescued them. He had requested to be transferred to their unit from his own all-German one, forever grateful that Ben hadn't let them to die. They could often be seen with each other, cracking jokes and such. Ben decided that he liked it. He had friends back in Birmingham, and obviously respected his brothers in an arms, but it was good to have someone he could confidently call a close friend. You know, Adolf said. Breaking the my father didn't want me to join the army. Ben set up, and Adolf hadn't mentioned his family before. Really? I would have thought you Germans would be well a bit more eager to help with serving your country, given the well Ben gesticulated vaguely. Adolf laughed, huh? I can understand what you mean, but no. He was an accountant and wanted me to stay and help him with the firm, but it was my mother who told me I should do whatever I wished to serve the fatherland, and here I am, he said, waving his mug in the air, merry old England. Ben waved in turn, shaking his head. It's funny you should mention that, actually. My dad died, so it's just me and my mom, and she wasn't too keen on me leaving her, but I had to do something. It was either this or the factory, you know. Adolf nodded understandingly, the fire crackling away, he raised his mug again, to carving her own paths. Fontaine's a petition. Despite the government's uh, best efforts to accomplish a serious economic goals, I must report to the honorable members of the Commons that recent complications have forced us to adjust our expectations for economic progress in 1963. Dombill was in a foul mood. Isn't he dead? But he not brought Fontaine to his office to hang him. He was here to wear a witness to the Prime Minister's frustrations of Butler. The two sat down in the Prime Minister's office and discussed Britain's lackluster economic performance. The little mood descended further when they discussed matters on the continent and in the north. These minor shortcomings will be resolved presently, but pending for the planning of the 1964 budget. While we are unable to achieve full employment this year, the Treasury will continue to work diligently so that the full goal of full utilization for our labor pool will be accomplished. Fountain set his tea down and broached an uncomfortable subject. The pragmatist promises and planning for the economy had failed to him. That much was clear. He spoke of his own ideas, one that he, Bean, and Ham had shared on long nights in their offices. He spoke of new directions the country could take, and Don Bell steepled his fingers as he, of course, listened. Um, this government will pers per persevere despite the recent setbacks. We will continue to work for prosperity, stability, and security. We assure these honorable members that we shall meet all economic goals to be determined in our 1964 budget. After an hour, Domville dismissed Fountain so he might deal with the rest of his busy schedule. Uh, uh, Fountain lingered in the doorway before leaving properly, of course. He turned to Domville and left him with words of warning. Butler's failures would have greater consequences with an economic downturn. Should Butler fall again, they might earn Germany's ire. God only knew what might happen to their tensions return to the Isles. Um, let's see. Uh, branches. Every man's heart pumped faster than any of them could have ever imagined. The sweaty hands they shook as that familiar pain in the sword-like tree branches scratched against their legs, peeling back their skin like a cheese grater. Time to heal would satisfy them, but death was too high of a price for satisfaction. The unit rushing into the forest caught the ear of Colonel Tim, scraping the mud caked into the Great War era helmet. Alerting the command of his auxiliary unit, permission was granted to probe the men. The blood needed into a home guard logo engraved on one of their shoulders called for the auxiliary's help. Once men found the colonels calling to the camp, they were called again, but this time to the HQ of the site. All of them, completely exhausted, did not have the energy to make plans. The only thought running through their head was water in a place to lay down. It didn't matter to them if it was a soft mattress or the dirt. Thomas Oliver, the young leader of the squad, immediately raised some issues with the plans laid out across the table. Wait, 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 wait where are you going to get the resources for such an attack? I don't mean to demean any of you, but we're just militia. We can't go throwing ourselves against a panzer and think they won't notice. 
Colonel Tim went to interject, but conflicting noises of British, German, and boots marching across interrupted him. Everyone stomach drop. Tim took the initiative and managed to peek outside without alerting them, as Jordan's knobheads. The boy in their stomach immediately filled with warm excitement. Crap, well, you know what, they could probably repurpose these plans for the current moment. Let's me start. The guns would grab themselves as everyone nodded with every word, batting, batting down the hatches. To say that Ronald Nile Kane's first formal, formal cabinet meeting was unusual would have been the understatement of the century. It was not normal for the cabinet to be meeting whilst number 10 was a pile of rubble. It was not normal for half the attendees to be military officers, many from a foreign nation or less, and it was certainly not normal to be meeting as a country plunged into civil war. The gentlemen, we meet today. As a country falls into a crisis beyond anything it has ever faced before in its long and noble history. Should we fail here, then Britain, as we know it, and love her, shall fall forever. The whole room nodded in agreement, Fontaine and Wallop especially so, with Butler glancing over towards Walt Wolf, alongside a fair few of the British officers present. The room was united in fear of failure, even if divided on the reasons for their desperation to prevent a Himmler victory. I feel, therefore, it is imperative that we begin with an overview of the military situation. General Templer, General Wolf, if you please. The two officers stood and began to read the reports. Wolf began by informing the cabinet that the German garrison had now fully mobilized and was ready to fight, with fresh divisions already en route to relieve the battered forces that had held firm against Himmler's initial assault. Templer then took over a grimmer note, Scotland. The complete fall of Newcastle to the rebels had cut off divisions stationed in Scotland, and they are now completely surrounded and besieged in Edinburgh. They are holding firm for now, but until relief came, and then the entire Northern Army could be wiped out. Thank you, generals. This is grave news indeed, Now, now that Kane said as Wolf and Templar sat back down. How do you recommend pre we proceed? Any kind of offenses is out of the question. We need to outlast the traitors and survive the winter. If we can do that, then a summer offensive will be able to smash right through their lines. Templar replied with both nodding in agreement. Thank you, generals. Well, gentlemen, it seems our path is clear. Batten down the hatches and wait the storm to storm out. Once the rabble runs out of steam, we strike and strike them hard. We mustn't falter, not now. And so begins long winter. The other long winter, of course, too. As we're doing Birmingham at all costs. If London is the cultural center of Britain, then Birmingham is the industrial capital of Britain. Its people were the first in the world to experience the wonders of the Industrial Revolution. It's fine work to toil away, helping fuel our economic boom. Birmingham has moved on since then, for, not as, for it is not the giant it once was. Its products no longer flood the world markets, nor is the industry ablaze with the spark of new innovations. It is still a great industrial city, the center of a great amount of our industry. I cannot be allowed to fall into resistance's hands. We must hold the city, or else much of our arms and industry will be lost. Industrial report, Home Secretary. As per your instructions, the Home Office has compiled the following status report on the in uh, statuses of industry under control. Due to the volatile and unpredictable nature of war, industry located in or around the front lines has been excluded from this report, though we nonetheless feel it presents a broadly accurate picture for all. Factories and other such manufacturing sites are the most frequent targets of Himmler's sabotage, primarily through agents embedded within the workforce. We believe this to be the work of underground trade unions that uh, trader Maxwell Knight assured us were destroyed. Plans for the thorough destruction of these groups are being compiled with the assistance of our German allies. These sabotage efforts have caused severe disruption to enemy supply lines and have significantly impacted our capacity for military production. The German mega corporations, Reichswerk, AEG, Volkswagen, etc., are a particularly troubled spot. The ongoing political turmoil in Germany has spread to the corporate sector, and their offices here are embroiled in the power struggle across the channel as a rebellion here. Many senior officials within these corporate companies are highly cooperative, uncooperative, not only with us, but garrison and diplomatic officials who are not supporters of their own faction, creating massive logistical problems. Much of the workforce is also openly defected to the rebel side or simply refuse to work. This has caused production levels to plummet and forced managers to, to dramatically increase workers' hours in the remaining functional factories, in turn spurring further defections and resignations. We suggest temporary nationalization of uncooperative German industry and prioritization of the police resources to defend factories. Blackshire auxiliaries may have proved useful in this role against, as guards. Some of the workforce problem is much harder, but we suggest a carrot and stick approach of temporarily increasing wages along with severe penalties for refusing to work. Signed, your undersecretary. Our wives in. Hmm. Paternalism versus or a singular solution. Or fascism. Fascism. Well, well, we want to go with Butler. So it looks like paternalism is in. Um, so if you want to buy a simpler solution, please go ahead. I prefer this one because it looks like, well, actually, inflation decreases, but growth doesn't go up that high. For this one, we lose stability, which I don't like, but growth goes up by 0.4 anyways, and we get industrial expertise, which is actually probably better overall. Once, 20 years ago, we found ourselves in the same dilemma as we do now. Our workers were out fighting a great enemy, and our factories lay vacant. In response to such a problem, the government's answer was simple, put the women to work. Whilst we may have lost the war, the idea itself is perfectly sound. We may face some opposition from the traditionalists in government, but simply showcasing the dire straits of our situation and reminding them of their fate. If we lose this war, we'll be enough to shut them up. So as a man go after war, the women shall enter the workforce, all must work to keep our government afloat, or anarchy will rage Britain once more. And simplification, simplification, simplification. For centuries, British arms have been some of the finest in the world. Our rivals have played conquests across the world, aiding us from our early days in the American continent to our easy conquest in Africa. They've been heralded as great for the centuries, and the quality is not weighed even if the status of Britain had. 
Yet the greatest weakness has always been in time and materials needed to construct them. Once when we master, we were the masters of the world. We could afford such time and materials. Yet the Britain of today does not possess such luxury. Thus we must simplify. Though not, there will be, a, there might be a lower quality. More guns will be produced to armor soldiers. On the battlefield, a quickly made gun is better than no gun at all. And some comments include the winter of 1962 to 63 was uh, Britain's coldest winter in centuries. It ended in early March of 63. So that's, that's interesting. Very cool. And in our time, they did extract people from flying dales. Filing Dells by helicopter. Interesting. Someone says they were kind of disappointed they didn't finish the Himmler path before releasing the update, but it's alright. They'll come out eventually. Um, someone says, if I understood correctly, you should be able to focus on just one state's defensiveness if you have just higher intel than Himmler. Oh, interesting. But I think I'll end it there. We're doing we're doing better than we have started in the episode. Our intel is okay. What kind of weaponry is not great, but we're going to do whatever we can here to make sure that we win. And I'm ignoring this right now. Oh god. But hey, if you enjoyed the video though, please consider leaving a like. It helps me out a lot. Subscribe if you are new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. I'll hopefully win the Civil War. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.